we'll get, well, that's, that's booming this morning. We'll go ahead and get, get started. Hopefully we can hear over the roar of the crowd this morning. And <clears throat> I'm going to pray and then we will look together at Psalm 109. Our Father, we thank you for your infinite abiding mercy upon us. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Uh, we thank you on this, uh, this crisp, uh, sunny Lord's Day morning that you have promised to meet with us, that you've promised your spirit to give us understanding of your word and uh, to lead us into all truth. We pray that you would sanctify us in the truth because your word is truth. We ask this for Christ's name's sake and for the good of all of your people. Amen. So we consider Psalm 109. We're going to work through today. This is in chapter 8 of Dr. Ferguson's book, uh, Devoted to God's Church. And it's a, an encouraging uh, chapter in many ways, a convicting chapter on the nature and the subject of prayer. And I have been astounded on, on many occasions uh, over the years how, how much the, the lessons in Sunday school line up and coincide with our, our sermon text. And I wish that I could take credit for that. And this is a testimony to my wisdom and planning. And, but you all know better than that. This, this is the, the providence of God ruling and, and governing his church and, and teaching and instructing us, growing us in the ministry of his word to us. And so we'll spend some time both in Sunday school, but also in the, the sermon today, looking at, from different vantage points, but looking at the doctrine and the practice, the discipline of prayer. Uh, he titles this chapter, or subtitles it, The Christian's Native Air, and he borrows that from uh, a hymn from James Montgomery. But let's look at Psalm 109, <clears throat> a psalm of David uh, to the choir master. Be not silent, O God, of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. Appointed, appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried... Let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be no none to extend kindness to him nor any to pity his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. For he did not remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and needy and the brokenhearted and put them to death. He loved to curse. Let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing, may it be far from him. He clothed himself with cursing as, is, as his coat, may it soak into his body like water, like oil into his bones. May it be like a garment that he wraps around him, like a belt that he puts on every day. May this be the reward of my accusers from the Lord, for those who speak evil against my life. But you, O God my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake. Because your steadfast love is good, deliver me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is stricken within me. I am gone like a shadow at evening, I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting, my body has become gaunt with no fat. I am an object of scorn to my accusers, when they see me, they wag their heads. Help me, O Lord my God, save me according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand, you, O Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you will bless. They arise and are put to shame, but your servants will be glad. May my accusers be clothed with dishonor. May they be wrapped in their own shame as a cloak. With my mouth, I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him 
in the midst of the throng, for he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. May the Lord give us uh, a blessing and, and as we understand his word and, and seek uh, to apply this and wrestle through what the Lord has, has, is teaching us. Some of the parts of Psalm 109 may strike us as, as uncomfortable. This is a prayer of David. And the things for which he prays with respect to his enemies are somewhat uncomfortable for us to think about. Uh, may his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. Uh, may even his, his mother, <laughs> may, may, may her sins uh, be remembered. So he's, he's praying in such a way that sounds, on, on first blush, as, as vengeful or vindictive. Uh, but that's not the case at all. But he's, what he's doing is recognizing how desperate his own situation is. And Dr. Ferguson references Psalm 109 on a couple of occasions in this chapter, and I think helpfully so. And, and notably, he picks out from verse 4, in return for my love, they accuse me. And the ESV says, I give myself to prayer. But literally, in the Hebrew, it's I am prayer. And he, and he, and he takes from that, he, he gives an anecdote from, from his own uh, time as a young man and, and having this sort of aha, lightning bolt kind of moment, reading and meditating upon this psalm, that this is the Christian's vital breath. This is the Christian's native air. That in a sense, we are prayer. Uh, the, 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 not only do, do our uh, prayer is not merely something that we do. It's something that we are. It's something that ought to identify us as God's people. Jesus said that his house, the Lord's house, is to be a house of prayer. When, when we associate God's people, when we think about God's people, do we think about prayer? Because in... in, in you know, the, the, in Christendom, if we wanted to use that term in, in, a, in its largest sense, in, in the realm of Christian thought and understanding, and, and the way that our culture perceives Christian thought and understanding, where does prayer fit into that? Are, are we known as a praying people? Even our adversaries, even those who are opposed to the gospel of Christ, do they see us as a people who are humble in prayer? And, and, when we do people look at Christians and see loud, talkative, proud people, or do they look at us and see these are a needy, humble, thankful people who are utterly dependent upon the Lord? And do, do our the way that we pray, the way that we come together and speak to our Lord, does it testify to that fact? So from these this this psalm and, and thinking through this. Ferguson comes away with three, kind of a three-point outline. Any, any good preacher is going to have a, a three-point outline, right? But he recognizes first, not only, certainly we praise God. In the last two verses of the psalm, that's what David does. With my, with my mouth, I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng. But in addition to praise, what does prayer do? What does prayer testify to? What is, what is, what is the function of prayer? prayer. And first and foremost, we pray to God because we are weak and in need. We are weak and we are in need. And, and David testifies to this. The, for the whole, the whole backdrop of this, we don't know the particular circumstances. We could probably point to a number of occasions within David's life when, this, when he could very well have made this very same prayer. When he was on the run, he testifies about his He's, he's fasting. His body has become gaunt with no fat. I'm an object of scorn to my accusers. David knew that at multiple times in his life. He prays out of a sense of weakness and need. Dr. Ferguson makes this observation. He says, prayer is already an expression of our weakness, but what if, as we pour, our, pour out our weakness in prayer, it is intensified by the fact that we do not even know what to pray for as we ought. This is weakness taken to a different level, weakness wrapped up in further weakness. And surely, if you've, if you've walked with the Lord for any length of time, 
you've, you've had something similar to this, maybe not to the degree of David, maybe you haven't been driven from your home. Uh, perhaps this was on the occasion of his own son Absalom betraying him, forcing him from Jerusalem, and David is, is forced to flee. Perhaps this is a time when, before he was king, when, when Saul was pursuing him even to death. And David, in his desperation, goes before the Lord and confesses, I don't even know what to pray. I know I'm in need. I know I'm in desperate. Uh, physically, I'm desperate. Spiritually, I'm desperate. I don't even know what to pray. Well, Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. He says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. There is a great need, and sometimes we don't even know. In fact, can we say it? All the time, we don't really know what we need. Even on those days when we think we are most confident, Lord, I know exactly what I need. If you will just listen carefully to me, we can work this thing out. And Sometimes we pray kind of like that, don't we? Lord, I know what I need, and if you will just give it to me, everything will be well. But we recognize that at any given moment, even on our best days, we don't really know what we need. But the Spirit of God does. We have an intercessor. Christ himself intercedes for us through his Spirit. And he searches the hearts and he knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And sometimes it's beyond even our capacity to form language, to form words in our head. We just go before the Lord sometimes in tears, sometimes in joy, sometimes in, in despair and fear, anxiety, and we can't even express what's going on in us. Uh, the Psalms are, are wonderful means that God has given to us to, to help us to put into words those things that we, we can't utter ourselves. But we also recognize we have an intercessor who is able, even when we are not, to go before the Father on our behalf and express what it is that we need. There's a, there's a helpful sort of counterbalance to this, or not necessarily a counterbalance, but a counterpoint uh, to those who, who look at this passage in Romans and say, see here, here is, is teaching a sort of a private prayer language or speaking in tongues and those kinds of things. And um, In the footnote there, it's on page 119, he says, this is perhaps one of the most common statements people make about prayer, but while we do have communion with God while we pray, and in the midst of our praying, light may dawn, if that light truly comes from him, its source is, written, is the written word, now illuminated to us by the Holy Spirit. He's working with this idea that when I pray, this is God speaking to me. But that's not what prayer is. Prayer is us speaking to God. Sometimes we don't know how to articulate what we need. We don't even know, we don't even understand fully what we need, but it is always our speaking to God. The way that God speaks to us is by his word. And, and his spirit may prompt us to, to, to recall certain things as we pray, but it is not God speaking immediately uh, to his people through that means of prayer. We, we sometimes have that backwards. Prayer is us speaking to God. In, in the last, near the end of that footnote, he says a little reflection on these passages indicates that what has happened to the psalmist is that the revelation of God's character, the truth of his promises, and the reliability of his sovereign hand in providence have been brought to mind by the Spirit, and light has dawned. The psalmist does not reconstruct this in terms of an individual revelation that is known exclusively by himself. Um, there, there are many uh, false teachers who claim they've, they've gone into their prayer closet, so to speak, and they've come out with a word from God. That is not how God works. That is not how God speaks to his people. He speaks to us through his written word, through what has already been revealed infallibly as his spirit has breathed out his word through his designated messengers. And he, in his providence, has caused those things to be written down. So prayer is, is our speaking to God, and it is, it is certainly praise and thanksgiving, but it is also... Our giving to him, our, our explaining to him, our pouring out to him, our needs, as much as we are aware of them, but also 
recognizing that his spirit is working in us and through this means to put before his throne needs that even we are not aware of or don't fully comprehend. There's a second observation that uh, Pastor Sinclair makes in addition to prayer testifying to our, our weakness and need, but it's also that prayer is it's more than just that expression of our need. It, it's a way of life for us as Christians. This, this ought to identify us. It ought to mark who we are. And again, this point comes up again in Colossians chapter 2 and our, our Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, we'll see in the sermon today. There's a growing sense that we live in the conscience, conscious presence of the triune God. As we mature in, in Christ, as we, the, what Calvin called that quorum Deu, we live in the presence of God. We live before his face. And prayer testifies to that. Prayer testifies to the fact that not only do we need him, but this is, this is who we are in him. We live before him at all times. And so we can, in a sense, we, we look at Romans 1, and we know that the unbeliever suppresses the truth of God in unrighteousness. The, 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 the attributes of God are plain, according to natural revelation. Well, for the believer, we have, we have both books opened to us. We have the book of nature, which testifies to us of the reality of a good and gracious God, but we also have God's revealed word that testifies us to the full revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet, even then, we doubt, we grumble, we, we fail to see the goodness of God in, in, those, in those things. We, we, we fail to recognize that we live before him at every moment. And we think that, or we, we don't think this, but we live as if God doesn't see, God doesn't know. So we, we are prayerless because we're not, we don't recognize the ongoing real-time connection we have in union with Christ. And, and prayer is a testimony that we're in a constant conversation. You know, in, in the course of a, of a marriage, when husband and wife are together, there's a frequent conversation. Sometimes it's verbal, but as you get to know each other, a lot of it's nonverbal. We're just constantly able to communicate, sometimes even just a look, a glance, and you know what the other is, is, is thinking because there's that, there's that one flesh union, there's that connection there. Well, how much more ought it to be when we have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us, dwelling within us? There's a constant connection with our, with our Heavenly Father through his indwelling spirit, based on the mediation of his son. Ferguson says, as Christians, we live in a world where the moral and spiritual atmosphere is polluted, but by God's grace, we can be constantly breathing in the pure oxygen of another world, living in an atmosphere of prayerful communion with God. Thus, we can share every experience with him. The line, so to speak, between us is always open. The Apostle John found this to be a reality. He wrote with a sense of wonder that through the Holy Spirit, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We thus learn, as Paul urges us, to pray always. And as our forefathers like to say, to keep short accounts with God. We know we are known by him. We hide nothing from him. We share everything with him. I mean, this is a testimony to who we are. It's the air that we breathe. We, it's not only that we, that we pray, it's that we are prayer. So it testifies to our weakness and need, testifies to the fact that this is, this is who we are, that we are constantly in connection with our Heavenly Father. We, it is our, our duty and our privilege to grow in the consciousness, says Ferguson, that we live before his face, the desire in all things to glorify and enjoy him in everything we do, and in a word, to practice the presence of God. Practice the presence of God. But we all know that there is, there's a problem in all of this. It sounds really good. We have our needs. We know that. We live in the full conscious presence of God, and, and prayer testifies to that reality. But the problem, and we know this, is us. Our, our own uh, sinful hearts, our, our distracted affections. And, and we look at prayer, and we say, well, this, this is... This is hard. And I think in, in some ways it, it grows harder all the time, partly because of, of the nature of, 
of our human lives as we grow and um, mature into adulthood, we're taking on more and more responsibility. So there's a lot of an increasing number of things that distract us, right? The, the ordinary things of life, the, the, the bills and the, all the administrative things in a household. And, and uh, the Apostle Paul even testifies to this fact that the, the married man is, is worried about worldly things, taking care of his wife. The, the married woman is worried about worldly things and taking care of her husband. And those are not sinful, but they do occupy our time. They occupy our affections. And, and they compete with our, our time, our energy, our, our attention, our affections that ought to be spent in prayer. So the conclusion to that, and this is an inference that uh, Dr. Ferguson draws out, he's exactly right, is that prayer is also a discipline. Prayer is a discipline. Uh, it, it, takes, it takes work. Uh, it, it takes a, a concerted effort. It takes an intentional effort on our part. Um, it requires commitment in us for us to be devoted to prayer. He says, Prayer, then, may not be so easy. It becomes a battle to find time and to focus our minds and to consciously seek God's face. Yes, discipline is needed, for prayer is often hard work. And as the wise spiritual guide he was, the author of prayer commented that unless we see prayer as work, we may never get around to including it in our schedule as a basic discipline in our lives. You know, there, there are certain things that, that are an immediate fruit or direct fruit of our regeneration. When we are born again, uh, we are, are, are we're given a new heart and, and new affections. And some things just come automatically and naturally to us as believers. And, and a desire to commune with God ought to be one of those things. But it doesn't mean that there isn't work and labor and effort and attention that's required on our part to seek those benefits. At a my senior year in college, I was a marketing major, business major, and I had an entrepreneurship class. We had a an older man who was sort of a part time professor. He was in his probably in his late seventies or early eighties at this time. He was quite the character, and he he used to say he had started bought and sold more businesses than most people will in, in a lifetime. And he made a comment one time that, that has always resonated with me. He said, when you're running a business, when things are good, you can afford to advertise. You've got extra funds and you can afford to advertise. He said, when things are going badly, you can't afford not to. And I think we are, if that's true of, of something like that in a, in, a, in a business that's ultimately wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to burn up. How much more is that with respect to spiritual things? When things are going well, and we, we can, in a sense, afford to pray. We, we have the time, we have the energy, we have the desire, we have the zeal to pray. Well, things are not going well because someone has sinned against us or because we are mired in sin or because we are anxious or because we're fearful or because we are, are lonely or sad and we avoid praying. At the very time when we can afford, we can't afford not to pray. He points to Epaphras as an example, and we'll see this, and I'll reference this in, in, in today's sermon, in Colossians chapter four. Epaphras was very likely the the pastor of the Colossian church who had made the journey to Rome to visit Paul to seek his counsel and advice on on how to help shepherd the people of God and to help steer them through the dangerous waters of false teachers and, and empty philosophies and deceptive schemes that were infecting the church or threatening the church. And Paul says about Epaphras, he's one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, and he greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. And that word struggled is, is the Greek word agogit, uh, agonizomai, which you can, as, as Ferguson points out, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to recognize the root word in there, the word agonize. It's hard work. It is a labor. It's a fruitful labor. It's a blessed labor. It can be a joyful labor, but it is a labor. And he points to, uh, uh, gives an illustration of a man that he knew in Northern Ireland 
and who was a man who never married. He was a banker by profession. But he taught a Bible class for high school boys, and he had actually up, even passed over career advancement in order to devote himself to this teaching. And he, it was, the testimony goes that many of his boys distinguished themselves in various professions. An unusual number of them became ministers. And he followed their ministries with interest and ongoing encouragement. He prayed for them. When he died, the police had to be called. They broke into his home and found him, his body on his knees, with his prayer book open and a list of his boys that he was praying for. It's a life devoted uh, to prayer. It's a life that's intentional about these things, who recognized the, the labor of it, but also the great fruitfulness of praying in this way. May we be such people who, who look uh, to the welfare of others in our prayers and to think about it in that way. And next week in the, in the sermon, particularly in verse 3 of Colossians, Paul, Paul is praying in, in that way and encouraging the people of God to pray just that way, to pray that, it, that God would open doors for the gospel. Um, the, the new man in Christ ought to have a heart for missions and to see, have a heart to see the gospel spread and the, na- and the fame and the name of Christ go uh, to all the nations. So we think about praying as a testimony of our need and weakness and as, as a testimony of who we are with relation to our triune God and, and a, a recognizing that prayer is a, it, it's a labor, it is work. It is, it is toil and striving at times because, let's be honest, sometimes we don't feel like praying, do we? There are times when, for whatever reason, we're, we're, because we're weak in flesh, we're tired, or hungry, or something else, or, or, or spiritually, we're stubborn and rebellious, um, or we're, we're, we're discouraged in spiritual things. Maybe because a relationship is not going well, maybe because... Uh, there's, there's been, there are difficulties in our life that we're experiencing, we're, and we're hesitant to pray. And recognizing this as a, as a seasoned pastor, Dr. Ferguson says, you know, the Lord helps us in these things. He gives us two, two helps um, in, in this area of prayer. One is, is a prayer to get us started. The, the disciples recognized this, and they went to their, to their master, to their rabbi, to Jesus himself, and said, Lord, will you teach us to pray? I mean, can you imagine that? These are, these are boys who grew up as, as faithful Jews. Uh, they, they had walked with Christ. They, they had seen him pray. They'd heard him pray. And they come to him and said, teach us to pray. Um, it's instructive, I think, and, and, and humbling if, if we would take that to heart to go before our Heavenly Father, to go before His Word and say, will you teach us, Holy Spirit, to pray? And the Lord responds with what we know is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in Heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we're working through We've been working through these in our, our catechism. Um, the Orthodox Catechism spends uh, quite a bit of time working through the, the different phrases in, in the prayer. So I'm not going to spend as much time on that today, but recognize that, just in summary, when we call upon our Father in heaven, we have the privilege of coming into his presence. The Lord has put before us that we are family and that God will receive us And that we are to ask for both spiritual and practical things. We are to ask for the good of our soul and also for the good of our body. We are are to look for the interests of ourselves and also look to the interests of others. We are to seek the advancement of his kingdom along with our own welfare. And then, lastly, the second help. We have not only a model for which we can pray, Words that are not just to be um, only a, a rote memory device or something that we 
we simply repeat um, as if the words themselves are, sometimes the Lord's Prayer is almost treated like a, 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 a pagan incantation, as if the words themselves have some sort of magical power. If we just repeat these words, it's almost like a, a good spell that we're casting. The Lord has given this as a model to us. We can certainly pray the exact words, and, and we can, and we do, in fact, even in our corporate worship service. But it, it's a model to, to help shape our affections, to help shape the things for which we pray why we pray for these things. But the second thing that Ferguson highlights as, as a help to us in prayer, recognizing that it is a discipline, it is hard work, and in anything that we do that's hard, we, we look to helps along the way. We look to things that help either to, both to motivate us, but also to help us in that work. And one of the things that he points out is, is a fellowship to keep us going. And, and, and very helpfully points out in the, in the Lord's Prayer, we pray our Father. We don't pray my Father in heaven. We pray our Father in heaven. There's a recognition that we are part of something bigger than just me, than just you. There's a, there's a, he says this creates in us a deep-seated instinct that we come to him as members of his family. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leverage... Some of this section this morning, there's an important point in Colossians chapter 4 that we will work through with respect to prayer corporately. Um, and I think Ferguson is helpful here to help us think about this. Uh, we will also notice in connection, he says, with evangelism, prayer is an area in which Christians have probably been, in, been encouraged to think too individualistically. We therefore need tend to lose sight of the corporate dimension of prayer. Sometimes when we think about prayer, um, there's, there's something that's in, in our flesh that tends to think very much uh, in, a, in a very small world. I am the sun in my world, and I revolve around that, right? Everything, or, everything revolves around me, and our, our orbit seems to be pretty small. That's by nature, but then also by culture. This is not necessarily true in every culture, in every age, but it is true in ours. We have a very individualistic culture. That's one of the marks of Western uh, democracy, and particularly America. And in and, and Texas, we get an extra double dose of this, don't we? Very individualistic, and we're proud of that individualism. And so when we think about prayer, we tend to think, not by nature, but also by culture, very individualistically. But most of the time, when the scriptures speak of prayer, it's corporate. It is, you go through the Old Testament, you'll see this over and over again when God's people call out together in prayer. We see this in the New Testament. We see this strikingly in the book of Acts, and particularly in those, those early days after the Pentecost, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, and, and the, the New Testament church is, is beginning to grow and thrive and and over and over and over again, Luke sort of peels back the curtain and shows us what the people of God were doing, how they were spending their time, and what they, where their affections were, were focused. And they were praying. They were praying together from house to house on the Lord's Day, gathered in public and, and also uh, gathered in, in, in smaller groups of brothers and sisters praying together. That's right. The, the ability to savor that. Yeah. Exactly. 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 So as we think about, uh, is, is if you had an opportunity to read the chapter, as we meditate upon this, did that, did that strike you as, was that kind of one of those, aha kind of moments, or one of those, maybe I call them a duh kind of moment, where I, I read something and I went, well, why didn't I see that before? Why didn't I recognize that? 
and the, the idea of the corporate emphasis of prayer and how much of a help that is. Uh, I've, I've noted, and as I look around even the room today, I've noted some of our young men learning how to pray and hearing them in our prayer meetings and hearing them lift up their voices to God and even hearing in the words that they use and the way they address our, our triune God, they've learned that. And many of them have learned it at home, certainly, but they've also learned it here, gathered among God's people praying together. But all of us have the opportunity to learn. So as, as you think, well, prayer is hard. Well, sure, it's a skill. Well, and if, in any other skill, if you've got a, you, you pick one. It can be in, the, in, in you know, I love to, to woodwork, and, and, and I've, over the years, had opportunity to go to woodworking shows and to go to get, take classes and training because you learn from people who are better at it. You learn from people who've done it longer, who have these particular skills. And if, and if prayer is a discipline, and it is, and if prayer is a skill, and it is, it'd be good to go and, and, and to a place where we are practicing those skills together and hear how others pray and learn not just to repeat words and phrases so that we can sound holy and pious, but, gen, but genuinely to learn. How is it that I, because you, you recognize and you will hear uh, among, um, in, in a public prayer meeting, you, you can hear very quickly those, those who are praying who have a, a, a maturity in the scriptures, a maturity in the spirit of God. And you hear how they pray and the urgency, the clarity, the simplicity of their prayer. Sometimes we can try to dress up our prayers with all kinds of fancy words and we never really get to what we wanted to ask. And, and we, we learn to pray by hearing others. And I know I have been very encouraged by many of you hearing uh, the, the burdens upon your heart, not only knowing you better, but through your prayers, knowing our, our Savior better. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it's 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 as if sometimes the Lord could say to us, "Spit it out already," right? Sometimes our kids will come to us, kind of hem haw around, and uh, spit it out. What, what do you want? And our heavenly Father could very easily do that with us. Say, spit it out. You, you've you've approached me with 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 um, you know we ought to reproach with reverence and awe. And, and sometimes the, the, the titles and the names that we use for God are a reflection of that, and that's great. We ought to do that. But if all we're doing is, is trying to put flowers around our prayers and never really get anywhere, then we've, we've missed something important. One final thing, and I'll close with this. Go ahead. And that's a good point. I mean, not only those who are, uh, whose, whose voice is giving the prayer, but those who are praying alongside, in, in a, whether it's in the corporate worship service or in our, our dedicated prayer meeting, it is, it is very easy to lose our focus. And it is a discipline to train our minds to, to, to stay on track, uh, to focus on, on listening to another's voice as we Put our amen together with, with a brother who's praying. Uh, he raises the, the issue, and helpfully so. He says, sometimes ministers and preachers daydream of being able to preach like someone else, perhaps like some great preacher from the past. A Baptist minister might well dream of being able to preach like Charles Haddon Spurgeon. 
but he, he but again, since pulls the, the veil back and says, well, okay, well, let's, let's think about that. H- how is it that Spurgeon came to preach like Spurgeon? He, he was a preacher at Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, and he was once asked what the secret was. And he says, the secret is in here. And he came to a door in the church building, and Spurgeon opened the door into a prayer meeting where perhaps 1,200 people were gathered to pray for the ministry. What power. And this is a reflection on on God's faithfulness to the means that he has provided. If God's people will lift their voices and pray and call upon him to open a door for the gospel, he is faithful to do as, as he says he will do church was showing that it was truly apostolic, giving itself to prayer and the ministry of his word, how thrilling that must have been. Not only thrilling to witness that, but thrilling to see the fruit of that year after year after year in the work of that, of that church, carrying on to this very day. Um, Spurgeon's sermons are still being uh, printed and read and, and a blessing uh, to many who read them. Anything else that st- stood out to you as we think about the, the discipline, the, the activity of prayer? Oh, yeah. Well, it will be in the sermon. <laughs> Yeah. But what what kind of struck me is, is the fact that you know Paul took that to the Lord. You know, he, he didn't yeah. with um that that wasn't an occasion to, to to bring that to someone else or talk to him. The Lord was his was his mm-hmm. confidant. Yeah. And so and, and that so happened not only was the Lord his confidant, but he knew in his heavenly state the Lord was the the only one, yeah, and, and right, the only one, and so uh, you know, I was, I was, I, I was encouraged by that, um, you know, because even at times uh, in, in husband and wife relationship, sometimes you may have a tendency, or let me say, I, I may have a tendency uh, to talk to my wife about something that I probably should be talking to the Lord about, um, and so you know that that was that was helpful. Kind of chew on that a little mm-hmm. bit to see, um, and not just someone and I, but there's you know, other passages as well where you see, um, you know, David going to the Lord in prayer um, and, and taking whatever um, situation or whatever you know, what, and, and not just when he was in need, but also he was the one that danced before the Lord, right? Um, and, and even his wife didn't like how it was presented, but he was thoroughly. Thoroughly encouraged to go before the Lord and not and not worry about what others were thinking. Amen. Um, and I think also the, the, the part about the um, the optional extra um, taking prayer and, and sometimes in our lives we, we see it as an optional extra. I think that was um, <laughs> something that we talked about. It, uh, I tell you what, um, it may have been some repentance in the Stevenson household. I, I will say that you know, at times I, I have taken prayer as an optional extra, and, not, um, and as we talked about it, you know, when, when we think about work, mm-hmm. we think about nine to five, or we think about a you know, predetermined time that you will show up because this is what mm-hmm. um, the job you know tells you. This is right. what you need to do, and a narrowly defined task. Right. Yeah. Right. And That's not my job. This is my. Yeah. This is right. Yeah. Right. You will be here, mm-hmm. and so. And so, you know, just thinking about that and thinking about prayer, do we treat it as such? Is, right. it, is it an intentional time that we're that we're obligated in a way to meet with the Lord at this time? Right. Um, and and so, um, and, and individually, but also corporately, you know, we we can family gather. You know, th- those are some things that you know, we 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 talked about and, and thinking through. And, um, and, and 
it, it was really good. Amen. Like I said, it was really good. To Amen. Me. That's in my notes for the sermon. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's the it's sort of uh, on the same lines as it was attributed to Abraham Lincoln that, you know, if I'm, if I had an hour to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first 45 minutes chopping, sharpening the axe or something like that. I don't remember exactly the quote, but same, same kind of principle. This is the sharpening of the axe. This is the putting a, a, a keener edge on our, on our thinking. Um, but also... In, in, in conflict, you, know, you mentioned husband and wife, but it could be in any, any situation. When we're, when we're in, you know, David in, one, in Psalm 109, this was an enemy who was outwardly out to get him. There are other times when we're just in a conflict with a brother or sister, and it's hard to stay mad at somebody when, you, when you're praying with them. You ever notice that? As a husband and a wife, you know, husbands, take your wife by the hand and pray. I mean, it's kind of hard to, it's hard to keep fighting and pray at the same time, isn't it? Um, it, it, has a, it, it subdues you both. It reminds you both of who's really in charge. Because in that, in that conflict, James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Is it not this, that you lust and you don't have? Basically, you're at war with one another because you both want to be in charge. And prayer reminds you that neither one of you are. There's a Lord in, in your home that's not either one of you. And the same with our, with our children and, and training them to pray in these same ways. Anything else? All right. Brother Q, will you pray for us?